So it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker of today, Dr. Mikhail Schwartz from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Dr. Schwartz redefined and pioneered the pivotal role of the systemic immune system in healthy brain homeostasis protection and repair. She coined the concept of protective autoimmunity as a physiological response that protects the brain. And her work has led to a novel approach for combating Alzheimer's disease using the body's own immune checkpoint blockade. She is professor of neuroimmunology, incumbent of the Maurice and Ilskets Professional Chair of Neuroimmunology, and is the current elected president of the International Society of Neuroimmunology. Her talk today is titled, Harnessing the Power of Innate and Adaptive Immune by Immune Checkpoint Blockade to Combat Alzheimer's Disease. Thank you. OK, good afternoon. It's a kind of unique situation that I'm speaking after my offspring. Jonathan Kipnis did his PhD with me. And his talk reminds me hours, days, and nights that we were sitting, discussing, and have fantasy about the brain. So you revived my, our discussion. So what I'm going to do for you today, I will share with you not the last five years, but the last, last 20 years working on the crosstalk between the brain and the immune system. And it's, well, it was not as simple as Johnny just described to you, because the first time that we tried to publish a paper show, showing that the brain can enjoy the benefit from the immune system, most of the community told me that I don't understand the brain. So now, 20 years later, we can easily speak about it and focus on how does it work and, where, where, and not whether it occurs. So uh, I'll start with the Alzheimer, which is the main focus of our work now. But I will share with you the data that led us to go to Alzheimer and to suggest treating Alzheimer by a mechanism that boosts systemic immunity. So we all know that Alzheimer is a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, it's, uh, the fa some of the pathological characteristics are all known. Currently, there is no disease-modifying therapy for Alzheimer, and we know that among many characteristics, there is a local inflammation. Attempts were made several years ago uh, to treat Alzheimer with anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, steroid and non-steroid, and all of them have fallen short. An article which was published in 2008 try to summarize why anti-inflammatory drugs have fallen short, suggested that maybe we don't understand the disease and we don't understand the immune system or the role of the immune system in Alzheimer or any other neurodegenerative diseases. In this article, which was published in Nature Medicine by several opinion leaders in Alzheimer, they suggested that maybe based on the work that emerged from my lab, and the cartoon uh, described, uh, summarize our view, is that uh, we suggested, as opposed to those that suggested to treat Alzheimer with anti-inflammatory drugs, that indeed there is a local inflammation. But we need uh, anti-inflammatory cells to make it all the way to disease pathology. And in order to do so, they have to, try to pass through a gateway. And this gateway for its activation, we need to act activate the immune system rather than suppress. And according to the study that emerged from my, our laboratory, uh, trying to treat Alzheimer with anti-inflammatory drug is like putting uh, ice on a frostbite. So what, I'm, uh, what I will show you today, that the brain is not an autonomous tissue, but it's very much dependent on the immune system for its maintenance and support, partly as was suggested by uh, Johnny. And then I'll show you that Alzheimer's disease is not uh, uh, cell autonomous, and it's not tissue autonomous, and it's involved immune system dysfunction. So uh, this is a summary of our approach to Alzheimer, boosting in, uh, systemic immunity by immunotherapy in a similar way that it's being used in cancer. 
And this is our proposal to treat Alzheimer, which is basically rejuvenating the systemic, systemic immunity in order to protect the mind. So um, what led us to this suggestion is uh, 20 years of working, which we, I, I call them as 20 years of struggling against the dogma, which started in 1998 and 1999 when we published the first time that monocytes-derived macrophages are supporting CNS repair. And subsequently, we found that also CD4-positive T-cells support repair. In 2004-2006, we showed, uh, when Jonathan Kipnis was in my lab, we showed that circulating immune cells not only support repair, but support LC brain plasticity. We demonstrated it support neurogenesis and cognitive ability. Subsequently, we discovered that the crosstalk between the brain and the, circula uh, the circulation is indeed in the borders. And we identified the brain choroid plexus, which is the blood CSF barrier, as a site where the immune cells can go through in a very selective and regulated way. Uh, discovering that the, cho the choroid plexus epithelium, which is within the blood CSF barrier, is the site for communication, led us to demonstrate that in aging and in Alzheimer's dysfunction, and this led us to suggest that immune checkpoint blockade can be a treatment in Alzheimer. So briefly, I'll bring you through the data, and then I'll show you the recent result. So this was the first demonstration ever, which I paid a high penalty at the beginning, demonstrated that monocytes-derived macrophages are not the enemy of the brain, but when they enter the brain, they support repair. At that time, there was no idea that my myeloid cells of the brain, the microglia, and infiltrating macrophages are distinct population of cells. They were thought considered as uh, redundant cells, and if we open any article from these years, you will find activated microglia slash uh, macrophages as if they are identical cells. Subsequently, we demonstrated that the T cell that recognize CNS antigen, in other words, autoimmune T cell, also support repair. Needless to say that at that time, we didn't know what are the relationship between the macrophages and T cell, and why do we need macrophages and resident myelid cells, the microglia, are not sufficient, knowing that they are 10% of the cells in the brain. Uh, a few years later, uh, using chimeric mice and uh, genetic models, we demonstrated that monocytes-derived macrophages are needed for repair, uh, partly because they are displaying anti-inflammatory role. In the model of spinal cord injury, we managed to show that if we deplete monocytes-derived macrophages, the repair is impaired. This is a model of spinal cord. And if we reconstitute with monocytes, we as, uh, re uh, reverse the impairment. However, when we uh, reconstitute with monocytes-derived macrophages that are deficient in IL-10, we are, are lost the repairing mechanism. In other words, we suggested that basically monocytes-derived macrophages are needed for repair because they are displaying anti-inflammatory role. Subsequently, we found that they are also a source of metalloproteases and they are displaying several other roles. Uh, at that time, we were struggling with a simple observation. We know that there is no limited number of T cell and macrophages in the periphery. Nevertheless, we never get complete repair. So we thought that the, T the systemic immunity might have a more fundamental role in the crosstalk between the brain and the circulation. And this led us to suggest that T cells support lifelong brain plasticity, including neurogenesis, and our cognition. This is uh, just to show you that if you placed animal in an enriched environment, uh, this, uh, as was suggested by Rusty Grade, uh, uh, that uh, there is increased neurogenesis, whereas if you place in, in pair, uh, uh, mouse that are deficient in their um, uh, immune system, such as skid mice, deficiency in T cell and B cell, or when we take nude mice, which are deficient only in T cell, in spite of the fact that we place them in an enriched environment, they, they don't enjoy the rich enriched environment, and there is no increased neurogenesis. This is just to, to show you how robust is the effect. This is staining for newly formed neurons in the wild-type mice, whereas this is staining for 
uh, newly formed neurons in skid mice. So it suggested to us that between the enriched environment and increased neurogenesis is at the, at the T cell or the immune uh, system. Uh, this is just to show you that also cognitive ability is impaired in skid mice, in immune compromised animal. This is a normal behavior in Maurice water maze, whereas these mice are uh, mice that are deficient in our uh, immune system, and you see that they don't have as good as uh, learning capacity as uh, wild type animal. So we were struggling for many years to, uh, and ask ourselves two major questions. First, how do monocytes de uh, derive macrophages enter to the CNS and support repair without breaching the blood brain barrier? And the most important question, how do T cells support brain plasticity if they are excluded from the brain parenchyma? In LC brain, you hardly see any uh, T cell in the uh, parenchyma. So uh, as was uh, suggested by Yoni with respect to the meninges, that the, the communication between the brain and the circulation takes place via the borders. So in, uh, in addition to the meninges, we know that the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier is another barrier where immune cells can uh, uh, pass through. And this is a very unique barrier. It's the only barrier between the brain and the circulation where the endothelial cells are not tightly connected. So it's a fenestrated barrier with respect to the blood vessels. The epithelial cells are sitting facing the CSF. They are tightly connected. In between, there is a stroma. So we thought that maybe the immune cells that enter to the CNS and support repair are entering through this barrier, either the leptomeninges or the blood CSF barrier. And what we found that even in a model of spinal cord injury, uh, we found that uh, monocytes derived macrophages that support repair are entering through the remote blood CSF barrier. We didn't find they are entering also from the meninges, but those that is locally displaying anti inflammatory role seems to enter mainly through the blood CSF barrier, which is remote from the site of injury. We were puzzled by this observation and we focus on this blood CSF barrier to find out what is the we, uh, which cells population are sitting in this barrier and how this support entry of monocytes derived macrophage. So we isolated a T cell from the blood CSF barrier and we found that the T cells are sitting mainly outside the blood vessel in the stroma and they are engaged locally with antigen presenting cells within the stroma. We isolated this T cell and we found the majority, like 97% of the T cell that sits out of, outside the blood vessel. The blood vessels are staying here with CD31 and you see that they are sitting outside the blood vessel in the stroma. 97% of them are effector memory T cell, which suggests that they are engaged with antigen presenting cells. And we found that they are locally produced interferon gamma, IL-4 and IL-10. IL-10 is relatively enriched in this uh, compartment uh, co as compared to peripheral or in uh, uh, the split. We further tested whether it is possible that following a, under injurious condition, cytokines that are associated with local injury or with inflammation such as TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-6 can activate this choroid plexus epithelium. So we culture epithelial cells, primary epithelial cells from the choroid plexus of uh, wild, uh, wild type mice. We, they reach monolayer and we expose them to cytokines that we envision are associated with injury and cytokines that, that we found that are lo locally produced within the stroma. And interestingly, we found that expression of uh, leukocyte trafficking molecules is uh, highly elevated by TNF-alpha and or interferon gamma, but there was a robust synergy between TNF-alpha and interferon gamma, which led us to suggest that interferon gamma can constitutely support trafficking uh, through the choroid plexus to low extent, but if there is an injury 
or pathological condition when a uh, synergy with TNF alpha, they upregulate a uh, cytokine. And indeed, uh, we tested it in several models of injury that the synergy between TNF alpha and interferon gamma is responsible for activation of this gateway and entry of monocytes. And we found very nice correlation between trafficking of molecules expressed by the choriplexus epithelium and the number of cells that we found in the CSF. Based on this result, we suggested that maybe interferon gamma producing cells at the, at the stoma of the choroid plexus can orchestrate trafficking through the choroid plexus epithelium. And then we ask ourselves, uh, is it possible that the fate of the choroid plexus will determine the fate of the brain with respect to aging and Alzheimer? So the first thing that we did, we took, uh, we uh, considered the possibility that in aging, the choroid plexus dysfunction. So what we did to this end, we isolated 11 tissue from young animal and 11 tissue from old animal, and we did robust RNA sequencing in order to find out whether the signature of the choroid plexus in aging is distinctive than a signature of any other tissue in aging, including, of course, the, the hippocampus and the spleen. And what we found that indeed, aging is associated with very unique uh, signature, and the signature was interferon beta, elevation of interferon beta in the choroid plexus of aged mice, which we didn't find in any other aged tissue, and we didn't find in young tissue. And we saw a robust increase in interferon beta production in the, by the choroid plexus in aged mice, and reduction in interferon gamma. We continue to see uh, whether we can neutralize the signature of interferon beta receptor or the signature of interferon beta within the choroid plexus, assuming that interferon beta, which is produced by the choroid plexus, can affect both the choroid plexus and the brain. So we injected antibody that neutralized interferon beta receptor in the CSF. As control, we use isotype IgG. And we found that we restored all function of the choroid plexus uh, to the level that is very much similar to young choroid plexus. Based on this, uh, and there is another issue which is very interesting, we found that the choroid plexus of aged animal express CCL11, a chemokine that was found by the group of Tony Weiss in 2011 that impaired cognition. We found that when we neutralize interferon beta receptor, we restore its level as well. We checked whether it affects cognition, so we take, took a big cohort of aged mice. We first scored the animal for their cognitive ability because like in human, not all aged mice are losing cognitive ability in aging. We are speaking about 20 uh, mouse, 20 uh, uh, months old mice. So we found that indeed 30% of the animal lost cognition at a old uh, age, whereas 30% uh, uh, still maintain good cognition, 70% of the animal lost cognitive ability. When we treated these mice either with antibody directed to interferon receptor or to IgG, we found that there are uh, aged mice that lost cognition and were treated with antibody directed to interferon beta receptor, we restored their cognitive ability. Whereas the IgG didn't have any effect. The same phenomena we found with respect to neurogenesis. After we published this paper, we were intrigued by the observation that interferon beta uh, by itself can uh, cause a reduction in cognitive ability, and we wanted to see which cells are responding to the interferon beta. We envisioned that one possibility might be the microglia. So we isolated microglia from young animal and from aged animal, and we found a robust signature in the aged microglia of type 1 interferon. We wanted to see whether this robust signature of type 1 interferon in the microglia is responsible, at least in part, for the cognitive impairment. And indeed, what we found that when many of the uh, features that appear in the aged microglia were neutralized, when, were neutralized with antibody directed to interferon beta receptor, are molecules that have already reported as impairing cognition. 
among which is beta 2M, which was reported by the group of Tony Weiss Curry that impairing cognition, but he didn't know whether they are coming from microglia. And another one is C4B, which was uh, reported by Beth Steven and others that impair cognition. So we found that it's interferon beta dependent, and when we neutralize interferon beta, we restore their level to level of young animal. We did also the reversal experiment where we infected the core plexus of young animal with interferon beta and found very signature, a similar signature. So based on all the data that I briefly uh, described to you, we were left with the following question. We found that both innate and adaptive immunity support uh, repair in the CNS. We found that T-cells support normal uh, brain function. We found that T-cell-derived cytokine orchestrate trafficking through the choroid plexus and affect uh, uh, which is mainly the interferon gamma. And we found that the fate of the choroid plexus determined the fate of the brain. And now we are asking what are the implications for Alzheimer's disease? So we know that we, there is a local inflammation in Alzheimer's, and since 2006, several groups, including our group, demonstrated that in a mouse model of A-beta-driven uh, a, a uh, pathology, a, increasing entry of monocytes-derived macrophages to the brain can reduce brain pathology and re, uh, reduce TNF-alpha level upregulate IL-10 and IGF-1. And the question is, I uh, was for many years, what is the role of monocytes-derived macrophages in the brain? Based on our data that monocytes-derived macrophages can enter through the choroid plexus epithelium, we thought that this is an, a good opportunity to test whether the fate of the brain in Alzheimer is affected by the choroid plexus. We have used two mouse models of Alzheimer. One is the one that is driven by five human mutation uh, that was discovered in, mainly in Sweden, and uh, this animal model was established in 2006. In this model, um, uh, it recapitulates many features of Alzheimer, including, of course, A-beta pathology, reduction in cognitive ability, loss of neurons, and loss of uh, synapses and local neuroinflammation. We have, we are, I'm going to show you also data that emerged from using a tau pathology model, which is driven by two mutations in hyperphosphorylation of tau. So we first envisioned that if this disease is associated with uh, the need for entry of monocytes-derived macrophages, we should check the choroid plexus. And what we found that from two months onward, uh, the choroid plexus show reduction of trafficking molecules, and you can see that the reduction is more robust with the, the aging of the animal. The most intriguing reduction was of 6 CXL10, which is a cytokine known to be associated with interferon gamma signaling, which was for us very intriguing. We found that the reduction of chemical uh, leukocyte trafficking molecules is both by mRNA and by immunohistochemistry. This is standing for the choroid plexus. This is uh, Claudine and ICAM. ICAM is, uh, so is a, traf a trafficking molecule, and Claudine is a tight junction in the choroid plexus. And we wanted to see whether this reduction is somehow associated with uh, changes in the repertoire of the immune system in the periphery. So we checked level of interferon gamma, and we found that level of interferon gamma based on uh, flow cytometry and intracellular staining for interferon gamma, and based on mRNA, there was a robust reduction in interferon gamma availability at the choroid plexus with the disease progression. And we found that there is elevation of regulatory T cell with the disease progression. FOXP3 are regulatory T cells. So we found that the, the loss of interfering, uh, the reduction in trafficking molecule may be associated with the loss of availability of interferon gamma, which may be regulated by a uh, loss of effector T cell or by elevation of regulatory T cell. A similar phenomena was reported by the group of Marquis in J20, another mouse model of a, a, a Alzheimer's disease which is associated with uh, A-beta. So based on this observation, we thought that we may be able 
to overcome the loss of trafficking molecules for the choroid plexus either by augmenting the level of effector T cell or by reducing regulatory T cell. Now we have a long experience with reducing of regulatory T cells since your uh, Jonathan Kipnis was a graduate student in my lab. So we thought that this might be for the proof of concept a good way to start. So what we did, we bred uh, the Alzheimer mice, the 5 x fad mice, with FOXP3 uh, DTR regulatory T cell and thereby got a mouse model of Alzheimer, which will allow us to deplete selectively only regulatory T cell. You can do it only once, so there is a transient reduction of regulatory T cell and then re they rebound. And the reason that they are rebound because there are rem remnants of regulatory T cell which are not diphtheria toxin receptor positive and they proliferate by more static driven proliferation. So we transiently reduced the regulatory T cell and we first tested whether these mice have improved cognitive ability. We tested it by Morris water maze. So what you can see here, the red show you acquisition by Alzheimer mice which serve as a control, no depletion of regulatory T cell, they receive the diphtheria toxin. The, the black show you the acquisition by wild type animal, normal acquisition, normal learning and memory curve. Whereas the mice that were uh, other Alzheimer mice that depleted of regulatory T cell, a month later show you a, a great uh, cognitive uh, acquisition similar to the wild type. When we tested the probe at uh, the stage where we removed the, the probe, so this is a, a water pool in which there is a probe, the animal don't see the probe when they enter it into the uh, water pool, they are pictured around and they learn to navigate themselves to the water, to the platform uh, based on the picture around the pool. So when we took the, uh, the platform, the animal spend most of the time in the, uh, uh, the animal uh, swim just to the probe in the wild type animal because they, they remember where the platform was. And in spite of the fact that there was no platform, they spent most of the time around the place that they remember the platform was. The Alzheimer animal don't don't le didn't learn and didn't remember where is the platform. So they spent equal time around any place in the, uh, in the pool. The Alzheimer animals depleted of regulatory T cell behave as well, uh, uh, almost as good as the wild type animal. So this led us to suggest the transient depletion of regulatory T cell was sufficient to boost systemic immunity and to, le to, le to lead to restoration of cognitive ability. We checked a uh, plaque burden and you can see the cortex and the hippocampus one month after the partial depletion of regulatory T cell, we see that there was a very robust uh, reduction in the plaque burden. We further tested whether this depletion of regulatory T cell was associated with elevation of trafficking molecule by the choroid plexus, which the, was the case. We found elevation in ICAM, we found elevation in CXCL10, and we found elevation in CCL2. We also found one month after the depletion of regulatory T cell, arming of both monocytes derived macrophages and regulatory T cell to site of pathology. So almost paradoxically, but that's what we envision, that the partial depletion of regulatory T cell led to recruitment or trafficking of mo both monocytes and regulatory T cell to the site of pathology. Based on this result, we thought uh, we need to find a way to deplete selectively and partially and transiently regulatory T cell or to augment systemic immunity. And this led us to consider that maybe immune checkpoint blockade might be the way. So to remind you, immune checkpoint blockade are a, a, a inhibitory the in, uh, inhibitory immune checkpoint that are expressed by immune cells, T cell express a family of receptors, some of them receptor to, for co-stimulatory, some of them receptor for inhibitory. Among the, the inhibitory immune checkpoint uh, is PD-1 and the ligand is PDL one 
Now, the ligand can be expressed by epithelial cells, by antigen presenting cells, and by regulatory T cell. So, PD1 and PDL1 keep a T cell under constant regulation, and they are preferentially expressed by autoimmune T cell as a mechanism to avoid autoimmune disease. We do know that PD1 uh, expression is going up with aging and with diseases when the cells are exhausted. So if we envision that if we block PD1 or PDL1, we may be able to unleash the T cell and thereby augment interferon gamma production and uh, induce the cascade of event that we observed before that in, is needed in Alzheimer's. So what we did, we took the 5X5 mice, the Alzheimer's mice in which the pathology is driven by A-beta. We gave the animal antibody directed to PD-1, and we found that as a result of it, we activate the core plexus in the signaling, which is interferon gamma dependent signaling. We found that there was elevation of our interferon gamma expression in the choroid plexus. If we gave the animal anti-interferon gamma prior to the anti-PD-1 administration, we block the elevation of CCL2 and we block the elevation of ICAM. So overall, what we observe that as a result of administration of anti-PD-1, a single injection, we augment trafficking molecule expression by the choroid plexus, the expression of which was blocked by interferon gamma, anti-body to interferon gamma. We tested whether a single injection of anti-interferon, uh, anti-PD-1 uh, affect cognitive ability. So a single administration a month later, we may monitor cognitive ability and plaque burden. So the red show you, uh, this was tested by a short version of Morris Waterways, which is called radial arm water maze. So in the water pool, there are six arms. In one of the arms, there is a platform. And basically, you monitor the number of mistakes that the animal uh, makes uh, before they enter into the right uh, uh, arm in which the platform is located. So the red show you the Alzheimer mice in the first day and the second day. And you can see they didn't learn and they didn't remember. And the performance was the same number of mistakes for all our, uh, the test. The gray show you animals that received antibody direct, uh, to, uh, directed to irrelevant antigen, uh, IgG. And the green show you the Alzheimer animals that were treated with anti-PD-1, and the black show you the wild type. So the animals that receive anti-PD-1 show a learning curve which was very similar to wild type animal. And it's very important to emphasize that in this mouse model, there is a complete loss of cognitive performance in this task at six months. So animal received antibody long after they've shown complete loss of cognitive performance in this task. Also, you can see, uh, you can see uh, also the plaque burden, which was very heavy in the Alzheimer mice that were untreated, animals that are received IgG, and these are animals that received antibody directed to PD-1. So we see reduction in both plaque burden, which is red, and the uh, green show you gliosis. We tested to see uh, whether this, uh, if we start early treatment, we see any effect. Uh, and we can see that, uh, the, uh, sorry, here we wanted to see whether both PD-1 and PDL1 have effect, and we can compare PD-1 and PDL1. And you can see that both of them show a similar effect. We move further to see whether the PDL1 effect is dose dependent, and you can, what you can see here, the, uh, the red show you the, uh, the black show you the wild type animal, the red show, uh, uh, the uh, uh, dim red show you the IgG control, the dark red show you uh, anti PDL1 at point uh, 100 microgram, the black show you 500 microgram, and the 1.5 is showing, shown here. So you can see first that there is a dose dependency and anti one at 500 microgram single injection or 1.5 microgram is very robust effect. We further tested to see because the effect is not di uh, directed to A beta or any 
pathology within the brain, we envision that it activates a common pathway in the immune system, which is irrespective of the, of the disease pathology. So we went further to tau pathology, which is a mouse model in which there are two mutations of phos a phosphorylation of tau. It's hyperphosphorylation of tau. As a result of it, the microtubules show uh, 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 tangles, and there is accumulation of uh, 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 tangles out inside the neuron and outside the neuron. It's also associated with local inflammation. In this mouse model, the first observation is uh, the dementia, with nephron, uh, cortex dependent dementia, and therefore the most recommended task to test this animal is for short term memory. So we did it by using t maze or y maze. The t maze uh, is basically there are three arms. When you um, first introduce the animal into this maze, you close one arm and you let the animal familiarize with the two arms. When you open the third arm, you monitor the time that the animal spent in the novel arm, the arm that they didn't, uh, they didn't see before. Uh, normal animals are driven by curiosity and they will spend most of the time in the novel arm. If they don't have any learning and memory skill, they ran randomly spend time in all arms. So what we found that if you at uh, first we uh, did, uh, we compare PD-1 and PDL one and we found that the animal, the wild type animal spent preferred time in the novel arm. The animal that were uh, treated with IgG, no preference. The animal that were treated either with anti-PDL1 or anti-PD1 has a clear preference, very similar to wild type for the novel arm. We further tested those dependency of PDL1, and you can see this very nicely. These are wild type animal preference for the novel arm. These are IgG treatment, no preference. Point, uh, 100 microgram, no preference. Uh, 0.5 microgram, uh, milligram or 500 microgram or 1.5 milligram, clear preference, very similar to wild type. So the same treatment with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1 was effective in better driven uh, animal model and a tau model. We wanted to see what is the effect on the peripheral immune system. What we found that there is elevation in effect on memory T cell as a result of the treatment with the anti-PD-1. And importantly, we found again in this mouse model using chimeric mice that the treatment uh, caused elevation in monocytes derived macrophages in the, the brain, and we found few monocytes derived macrophages, green cells, in the parenchyma. Based on this result, we suggested that immunotherapy, which is directed to systemic immunity, uh, induce a cascade of events which started with activation of the immune system, activation of the choroid plexus, and entry of monocytes derived macrophages. We still don't know what is the role of monocytes derived macrophages in the parenchyma, but we were puzzled by one issue. We know that in the brain, 10% of the cells are microglia that are myeloid cells. They enter the brain early during development from the oocyte. Our data suggests that we need monocytes derived macrophages in the parenchyma. And the question is why microglia cannot do the job? So in order to address this issue, I would like to emphasize that microglia, although they're myeloid cells, they are kept in the brain under strict control. There are numerous factors that collectively we call them uh, 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 checkpoint molecules that keep microglia under strict control to allow them to be phagocytic without causing any damage to uh, neighboring neurons. Among the known checkpoint is CD1, CT200, uh, CT200 receptor, fractal kind receptor, TGF beta. So there are numerous control mechanisms that keep microglia under tight control. So we thought that maybe this mechanism that are so advantageous in, uh, in our studies may be co uh, counterproductive under injurious condition. To address this issue, we collaborated with uh, Idomit in our institute and together we have several uh, common uh, graduate students. Together we embark on this study and decided to, to check what is the fate of microglia in Alzheimer's and in aging. 
So we isolated CD45 cells, uh, which are a total leukocytes, and did signal day RNA sequencing. What we found that unlike uh, in homeostasis, where all microglia are identical, in Alzheimer's disease, we found three population of microglia. The homeostatic microglia and two population of activated microglia. We we'll, uh, did a f further analysis, and what we found, which was very puzzling, we found that uh, this population of activated microglia is associated with reduction of some of the homeostatic molecules and upregulation of many molecules that are s associated with phagocytic activity, lysosomic activity, and metabolism. And intriguingly, some of the molecules that we found upregulated by my, this microglia by GWAS were suggested as risk factor. So puzzled by this, we further analyzed this microglia, and we found that different molecules expressed by the microglia show distinct pattern uh, in the activation profile. So for example, XB didn't show any changes uh, through all the activation process. CXCR1, which is the fractal kind receptor, which is known to be uh, a key for suppression of microglia activity, went down with the activation. EPOE went up and TREM2 went up. Uh, when you compare it to GWAS, you see something which is very interesting. The genes that are upregulated by this microglia are protective, and the genes that are downregulated by the, uh, in this uh, unique microglia are negative player in uh, Alzheimer. We further tested where, where this microglia, this unique microglia, are located, and we found both in mice and human they are located adjacent to plaques, which suggested they are phagocytic activity. And this is in human. Again, we found them adjacent to plaques in area which are free of plaques. We didn't find this molecule associated with this unique microglia. Now, because TREM was upregulated, and TREM has uh, uh, lately a uh, attracted a lot of attention in Alzheimer, we thought that maybe the TREM has a key role in the development of this microglia. So needless to say that there is a lot of literature about the TREM2 and there is a lot of controversy about TREM2 in the literature. So we thought that we have a big, uh, an opportunity to test what is the role of TREM2 in microglia. To this end, we collaborated with Marco Colonna and we uh, received from him Alzheimer mice that, are, uh, uh, that crossed with TREM2. So we have Alzheimer mice that are heterozygote from Alzheimer and monozygote for TREM2. And we isolated the microglia again by using CD45, uh, CD45. And what we found is the following. There was no difference in the microglia between wild type animal uh, TREM2 positive and TREM2 negative. In the Alzheimer's mice, what we found to our surprise, that the uh, microglia are stuck in intermediate phase. So they shifted from homeostatic to, uh, towards activation, but they've never reached the last stage, which are fully activated microglia, which suggested to us that activation of microglia from homeostatic to full activation is in two steps. The first step is loss of homeostatic, and the second phase is, uh, which is associated with elevation of TREM2, whereas the second stage is dependent on TREM2. So first stage is TREM2 independent, which is associated with loss of homeostatic, and activation of TREM2, and the second step is TREM2 dependent. We felt based on this data, we went further to see whether the anti PD1 or anti PDL1 affected this microglia population, and we found that uh, treatment with anti PD1 or anti PDL1 augment by twofold the number of this uh, unique activated microglia. And we found that this is at all stages, in, including old um, and mice. And we know that at 3, 6, and 15 mice, the anti PD1 and anti PD1 has a very dramatic effect on cognitive ability. And at all ages, we found elevation of this disease associated microglia or this unique microglia. Of course, at this stage, we still don't know whether the full uh, the activation of the systemic immunity 
is uh, effective in cognitive, uh, in improving cognitive performance because of the elevation of microglia or because of other activity. And we still don't know what is, uh, to what extent this activated microglia contribute to the re uh, repair. But overall, it seems that one mechanism by which the anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-1 affect the brain is via activation of microglia, and we are still working on it. Again, when we test the anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1 effect on mouse model of Alzheimer that deficient with STREM2, we didn't see uh, this unique microglia neither with or without the anti-PD-1, suggesting that this anti-PD-1 effect, which is mediated in part by the uh, activation of microglia, we cannot get it in the trend to knockout mice. And we are currently testing whether the anti-PD-1 is affecting cognition in these mice. If it's not affecting the cognition in these mice, it means that at least in part is mediated by by disease-associated microglia. So overall, what I've shown you today is that the brain is not autonomous and it depends very much on the immune system for its day-to-day -day maintenance and for repair. What I've shown, what we are suggesting based on these 20 years of work on the cross-talk between the brain and the immune system, that in the case of Alzheimer's immune checkpoint blockade can be an immunotherapy to Alzheimer's, and this will be the first immunotherapy uh, to neurodegenerative diseases. The unique of this immunotherapy is that it doesn't target the brain at all. It targets the systemic immune system. It activates a common pathway of repair independent of disease etiology. Uh, it may indirectly or um, directly affect the microglia. It addresses multiple factors that contribute to cognitive loss, and it may explain why a single therapy directed to A beta or to tau pathology is not sufficient. What we view that this immunotherapy is harnessing a natural restorative mechanism that either uh, in Alzheimer is insufficient or even possibly uh, the cells are not activated enough. And very important to the discussion today, that based on the mechanism of action, the regimen and the dosing uh, and mechanism of action are distinct from the one that is using in cancer immunotherapy. Our antibodies that we tested in MNML, the half-life is very, very short. Nevertheless, the treatment is once a month, and maybe we can even use a regimen that is less frequent than once a month, unlike in cancer, but this is currently working. This summarizes the way that we view it. In the brain, there is a local inflammation, and we know that anti-inflammatory drug falls short. We believe that under local inflammation, there is a signaling to the immune system. The immune system uses the toolbox, which is including many, many activities that the immune system can do locally. And so the choroid plexus epithelium, uh, they uh, can get into the brain and fix the brain. We believe that under a pathology such as Alzheimer or any other pathology, we tested other model and it seems to be very similar. And the, the signaling comes to the brain. The choroid plexus epithelium is dysfunctioning either due because uh, to suppressor cells or inefficient effector T cell, and they cannot get through. And by boosting the systemic immunity, uh, we can overcome the opening of the interface and let cells get in. Uh, this work was heavily supported by competitive uh, grant from the EU, and without this, we would not be able to survive. Uh, in research at the Weizmann Institute or in Israel in general. We are getting good support from the Israel Science Foundation, but is relatively slim to what we can get from competitive grant in Europe. Uh, this work was done by a graduate student. Uh, the, molecule, the genomic study was done with collaboration with Edo Amit. Uh, Tony Wascuri collaborated with us at the early stage of uh, working on the choroid plexus in aging. 
and these are numerous graduate students that over the 20 years contribute to the work, including Jonathan Kipnis that continues his own path and doing amazing job, and many other graduate students that are currently a professor either in Israel or in Europe or in the state, and thank you. We have time for a few questions. If you want to raise your hand, we can get a mic to you. I, I actually have uh, two questions, if I can sneak them in. Thank you for the talk. Uh, have you tried the combination of immune blockades to see if you could enhance the effect as the first? And the second question is the reverse of the hypothesis. Uh, there are several companies making agonists to PD-1. They're in human trials. Would you anticipate these could be dangerous in patients with cognitive decline, like Alzheimer's? I think uh, both questions were very good. Uh, so with respect to the uh, synergy or combination, we checked several uh, immune checkpoint blockade, including TIM3, uh, and TIM3 is effective. However, when we combined, for example, TIM3 and PD-1, there was no additive effect. Uh, but it's a single experiment, so maybe we didn't test the optimal condition. We tested CTLA-4, and it didn't have any effect at all. Again, negative results, you, can, you need to further investigate, but I believe that the CTLA-4, the negative effect, fits with our working hypothesis. Now, with respect to agonist, uh, I would view that it may be dangerous, and I can uh, support it by data that we did and others did. It, um, it's basically um, boosting level of regulatory T cell or activation of regulatory T cell. And based on our study and other studies in other model, it seems to be negative effect. Uh, also very important, we tried uh, anti-PD-1 and anti pd one in a regimen which is more reminiscent of what is using in cancer immunotherapy, and it was not ineffective. So it's very difficult uh, to extrapolate from one disease to another. It's very difficult to predict, but I would predict that anti-PD-1, you have to use it with very carefully. So I have, I have a question here. So how does this work reconcile with the data showing that interferon activates microglia and the microglia eat the synapses in Alzheimer's disease and actually make it worse? You're referring to the work with respect to interferon beta or interferon gamma? Uh, beta, type one. Okay, so this is a good point. What we found when we first published the paper with our respect to interferon beta in the choroid plexus, we were intrigued by the fact that um, MS patients are being treated with interferon beta. So if you go to the literature, you see that most patients treated chronically with interferon beta show cognitive uh, exacerbation, and you don't know whether it's because the continuous use of interferon beta or because of the disease progression. When we tested interferon beta, we found that there is a huge difference between acute and chronic interferon beta. Acute uh, exposure to interferon beta is beneficial. Chronic exposure to the interferon beta is detrimental both in aging and in acute injury. So it's the, uh, the, the, the duration of exposure to interferon beta. Any other questions? Okay, we'd like to thank our speakers.